me back to the place I know With the mystery shack and the forest gnomes I'm already back, so come on, let's go Don't get me started, my heart's in gravity falls Welcome to Mystery Shack Look Back, a nostalgic time capsule and no-spoiler book club of the original Gravity Falls fandom! We are your curators. I'm Ella. I'm Charlie. Why do you sound so much more excited than usual? I don't know. Maybe I accidentally ingested caffeine today, Charlie. Wait, did you? Well, I mean, apparently it's it's possible. Oh. Wait, no. Wait, it's possible to accidentally ingest caffeine? You only told me recently. That dark chocolate has a lot of caffeine in it, so you've... You've always said for your whole life you've never had any caffeine, and now you realize, exactly. oh, apparently I have a lot of caffeine. But I actually didn't have any dark chocolate today. I think, I'm sorry to hear oh, about that. Oh, that's right. It's because we're set to have a, today we're having on, like, a really, really big fan of Gravity Falls. Oh, a really big fan of Gravity Falls. Like, maybe the biggest fan of Gravity Falls. The biggest fan of Gravity Falls? All right. Uh, well. Oh, wait, hold on. It's, no, it says here that, that this person, uh, also voiced, uh, Dipper Pines. Okay. Oh, okay, yeah. Hello, Jason. Hello. <laughs> How are you guys? Oh my gosh, it's Jason Ritter, the voice of Dipper Pines. <laughs> How is everybody? Uh, yeah, usually we have to give so much context to who our guests are, but I think they're going to figure out, piece together how you were involved in this show <laughs> from the sound of your voice. <laughs> But we figure that, you know, big fan of Gravity Falls is just as important as Voice of Dipper Pines, which is kind of what this whole podcast is about. Oh, yeah. I, uh, I I am also a giant fan of the show. You are literally wearing the Dipper yeah. hat right now. We posted a screenshot I, of it to our Twitter. I, 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 I take it with me where I go. Um, it's uh, like a little talisman. Does your kid have one yet, though? Uh, she does not. <laughs> oh, you gotta, you gotta get them started early. Oh yeah, she well, she has watched a couple episodes of of Gravity Falls. Um, it's this definitely the scariest thing that she <laughs> yeah. watches. That's but fair. she'll say, you know, she'll say like, "I'm very brave of Bill." Okay, and I'm like, "Yes, you are." She's, like, "I'm very brave she of is. Bill and Gideon." Yeah, but are you? brave of bill i i am not as brave of okay. them and uh, i think if she they, had fought if she had been up against bill cypher it would have been it would have been no no contest <laughs> i think she's in the perfect age range where like she's learning shapes and so she's like triangle and you're like whoa i never noticed that before she's catching things <laughs> in the show i didn't exactly. i got your number bill you're a triangle you got three sides and three angles i know that <laughs> You're an equilateral. He is equilateral. Yeah. I've noticed that about yes. him. So I guess the first question is, uh, you know, how did you book the audition for Gravity Falls? Um, I just like anything else, I I sent in um I sent in a couple tapes, and then we did a. If I um, if I'm remembering correctly, uh, you and and Kristen have the same agent or manager, and that was how you. I think that's. Correct. I'm almost 100 percent sure that that's or, right. Or did at the time, I, maybe. Maybe did at the time. Yeah, I'm trying to remember. Um, but yeah, I, I it was I was really early on into my uh, like trying to to do voiceovers. Um, I had gotten close to one other thing and hadn't gotten it. And I've just been a fan of animation my whole life. And that's the first voiceover you've ever booked. Not technically, because when I was well, this is very weird. I'm I'm excited. <laughs> And I was like maybe six or something like that. My dad, it, it, well, and it's weird because there, it feels like there are strange foreshadowing tie-ins. Well, we love foreshadowing. We have a whole, yeah. <laughs> we talk about that all the time. <laughs> my, my dad was doing a cartoon called The True Story, either The True Story or The Real Story of Oh Christmas Tree. Oh. And he was playing, uh, Uncle Piney, the pine cone. <laughs> oh my gosh. Wow. Wow. And I was playing his nephew. Uh, so you're playing the nephew of a guy named Pines. Yeah, yeah. and then I have an Uncle Piney. <laughs> yeah. Instead of by, a grumpy. By the way, for the, for those who don't know, uh, Jason's dad is John Ritter of uh, Three's Company fame. Uh, also did a lot of voiceover. He was, he was Clifford the Big Red Dog. Clifford, yeah. He was Clifford the Big Red Dog. Um, yeah, he, he loved, and he, he, um, would always take us to like, you know, those animation festivals that would happen. And then when I got a little older, I went to like the sick and twisted animal animation festival. And then and you, you had an entire 
a convention hall full of people in the hat that your character wears. So, <laughs> yeah, small exactly. world, time flies. It was, yeah. Well, and it was funny, too, because I, I remember going to a convention wearing a dipper hat, and it was before Gravity Falls had come out. And I was like, I wonder if I'll ever see more of these. And then uh, I, the first year that I went to a San Diego... Uh, the, you, the, and, the, and then the, you never saw more of them, right? <laughs> I never did. No, I never really took off. No, actually, you... you you took a picture of Ella in cosplay at New York yeah, Comic Con okay. once. Yeah, I wasn't sure if I was going to tell the story, but I, it was uh, 2017. Uh, se- uh, um, and I, you were there for Kevin Probably Saves the World, I want to yeah. say. And so I guess... Yeah, yeah. And the reason Ella didn't want to tell the story is I was dressed as Strong Bad, which is to say I was shirtless and in a luchador mask and screaming. <laughs> and I called you gross at one point. Oh, that was that story? Me? It's the same I story, realize- yeah. <laughs> well, anyway, what must have happened was, I mean, again, because you're such a big fan of Gravity Falls, I figured you had to, you were just looking around for anybody dressed because I was dressed as Grunkle Stan. And, and then I hear this voice behind me like, hey, can we get a picture? And I was like, yeah. <laughs> so that was interesting. <laughs> anyway, uh, so part of this podcast is just me apologizing for calling you gross while shirtless and screaming. Um. <laughs> but yeah, uh, the, the true story of a Christmas tree. You were. <laughs> oh yeah. So so that so anyway. So I I had done that, but I just is bizarre that that like, in, when it comes to like that, it's all about pine trees. Did the character have a Uncle name, Piney or was it just like the nephew? My character was Little Acorn. Little Acorn. Uh, and I was a little magic acorn. Yeah. <laughs> and it was uh, it was before way before my voice had changed, even though it is feels like it's still in the process of it. So it's like yeah, my voice was so high. Uh, you know, it's still not the, the deepest ever, but... Uh, Uncle Piney? What do you want now? Do you think it's true that King Winter's castle is guarded by fierce polar bears? Who told you that? A little gossip. Ah, oh, she was just trying to scare you. She said they could swallow a gnome hole. And then you rolled up to Disney TVA and were like, I got this. I was Little Acorn. I was Little Acorn. Let me do this. Do you know who I am? I'm Little Acorn. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever <laughs> seen Freddy vs. Jason, but I am not the Jason in question, but I'm, I was there. <laughs> no, was in it. I was there. Yeah. I survived. So that begun your history with fighting dream demons. Yeah, that was that was my yeah. That, the Freddy vs. Jason was the first time I fought a, a a dream a dream demon. You never forget your first. You never do. You've been voice acting since then. Uh, Frozen two. Yeah. Yes, uh, I, uh, Frozen two, and um, I just have had a couple other uh, things. I a uh, Netflix show called Captain Fall, mm-hmm. uh, and. Um, yeah, a little thing on Amphibia that hasn't aired yet. Ooh. That was really are, fun. Are you exciting. under NDA? Do I have to edit that oh, out? No, no, that was on Wikipedia. That's, no, no, that's that not. was announced. I'm okay, sure. okay. I yeah. got really worried for a second that you were going to get us in trouble. <laughs> I've come on your podcast to sabotage. I mean, we're probably, if the mouse finds us, we're already in <laughs> <Yeah>. trouble. <laughs> so you've that was your on-ramp to being involved with the show professionally. But yeah. what about in a fandom sense uh when was the the on-ramp to that you know when i first started i was really excited to just be on a disney show kids show i kind of thought it was i I didn't really have a sense i knew it was funny and i knew it was spooky and i knew it was um uh, you know i i knew that i liked it and that i had fun but i didn't know that there was like a huge mystery until like a little bit into it and then I started to really get into it. Uh, according to the commentaries, it was when someone pointed out to you that Blendon appears in the background in the first couple of episodes. That was exactly that was exactly it. Because then I started to realize that, you know, I think in a lot of these shows where there's a mystery, it's very exciting when you get the sense that the person taking you on this journey has a plan, and they're not just like throwing in random stuff to you know because they're trying to get <laughs> lost. <laughs> <laughs> did, did your uh, sides just have Dipper's lines with context to them, or did you receive like a full script when you recorded? No, I got the whole script, but Alex was constantly through the whole thing putting in little things in the animation here and mm-hmm. there, or you know, like I didn't know about the 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 words in the background uh, for the second season until I could not crack the code. Oh, the visionaire! <laughs> uh, yeah, at the end of the first uh first episode of the second season i was like what's what's going on what got you onto the ciphers uh the ciphers i got on pretty quick as soon as i saw that there was a thing at the end of the show um i started to just kind of figure it out i do cryptograms and stuff like that so i didn't realize yeah, i that mean the... it seems like part of why you're cast you have such a dipper like 
way of <laughs> approaching, you know. <laughs> yeah. If there's a puzzle, I wanna I wanna know what the answer is. <laughs> yeah. Um but I didn't realize that the the you know the three letters back was backwards in the opening right, credits yeah. until later. I just sort of realized that it was I mean that helped a lot instead of just doing regular old substitution. I mean, but did you so initially you just like brute forced it. You were like plugging in Yeah, like is this this letter is the most used is it an e or yeah, R yeah. or s or t that's or all really that interesting stuff. yeah so yeah so that was the first time i realized like oh he is a, he has a master plan and the other thing that he did uh that stumped me until uh, well that stumped me the whole time uh was in in the in the blended episode oh, yep, yep. where you see the mystery shack and he's just said the biggest secret of gravity falls is in this shot and i scoured that Yep, yep. Four hours, and I couldn't. I was like looking at the lines. Didn't the he? You said like he printed it out. Is that yeah, right? I, yeah, yeah. So I could look at it, and I really, you know, I just yeah. Anyway, like he's toying with you. He's like, here, why don't you chew on this for two seasons? Yeah. A popular fan theory was that was not the past; that was the future, and that's not Stan. That's older Dipper, actually. Whoa, that's cool. I yeah. like that a lot. Yeah, maybe that was you. I yeah. like maybe you were that looking a lot. at a picture of yourself. Yeah. I like that a lot. A family resemblance. Cartoon there. mirror. It, this episode, it becomes incredibly important to talk about the fact that in uh, ap- around April 2013, some images uh, surfaced uh, on 4chan. Of, oh, yes. Of, uh, some of them were just random stills from episodes that had not quite aired yet or shorts. But one was what appeared to be a young man McGucket uh, with six fingers on his hand mm-hmm. uh, writing in what appeared to be the journal. Oh, yeah. Yep. I saw that, too. And before we get into the, uh, the episode proper, I did have another fandom-ish question about, like, what was your experience with the hiatuses? Because that must be a weird experience having worked on them and then waiting. Because obviously animation, you know, takes 11 months on a on a good, <laughs> you know, on a good schedule, but, like, to, to be fully completed... But, the, you know, the year of an air gap between seasons one and two, like, was that kind of a... And uh, Rob Renzetti, we interviewed previously, and he said he estimated that Alex begun work on season two nine months after Disney wanted him to. Oh, my God. I kind of see it as a as this incubation period for the fandom because there was nothing. So they were just kind of a community. They had their each other. Well, it's one of the nice things about having a episodic um thing you know a lot of shows now they like all episodes just come on at the same time you can just run through them all and there was something about the periods of time in between episodes or in between seasons that really allowed the the fandom and the theorizing to just kind of come to a nice nice simmer oh yeah if this had been streaming it would be Totally different. Yeah. What was it like for you both as, as a fan and, you know, as a performer who hadn't been this character in so Well, you know, I, I have to say one of the things that kept on happening at the very beginning was uh, because I because it was my first time really doing like, you know, I, I had done, I mean, Little Acorn and I had done like a little thing on All Grown Up and but it was just always like these little one offs. That's right. Yeah. yeah, it was it was just yeah. like a I played a teacher that Angelica had a crush on. Mm-hmm. I had there was like a learning curve for me where there would be times where I would go in and they would say you're not quite in dipper range. Can you can you go back to it's it's a little bit higher or it's or that's too Ooh, much. A little or, more anxious and sweaty. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Is it really possible to be too anxious and sweaty? Like, is there ever too much dipper? Are they ever like dial back the dipper? <laughs> that that can happen. Yeah, there were there were a couple of times. Interesting. I, uh, okay. I went too deep into my own uh, knowledge of uh, being anxious yeah. and sweaty, and they went. That's uh. You you definitely, from my observance as someone who has been voice acting online and a few, you know, freelance things here and there, came into your own in in it, and you sound much more comfortable doing it in season two i left behind oh this is a kid show which i think i i, I started in the first gotcha. season like oh i'm, a, that was I'm kind a of subconsciously a yeah it's yeah. scary and it's spooky and it's funny but you were like little acorn is gone angelica pickles is not here this is about nightmares <laughs> exactly. hello friends little a- <laughs> little acorn is dead <laughs> He probably is by now. Little Acorn is dead, kids. You have to move on. Ha! Little Acorn. Ha! I killed him years ago. 
You're good at those voices. A lot of – this is a very embarrassing thing to say to you. A lot of the ad revenue I make for my YouTube videos is – Specifically videos in which I voiced Dipper. No way! Uh, I'm sure you can hear I have the same kind of natural puberty squeak, <laughs> even though I'm, like, uh, almost 30. Nothing to be uh, ashamed of. I, I, just, you know. I remember the moment it clicked, the moment I was able to stop getting comments saying that sounds nothing like him, uh, was when I realized there are subtle differences between your performance in season one and season two, and I was imitating the season one. Oh, yeah. And I, I've been informed by many people it is impolite to do an impression of someone to them. So I won't <laughs> if you don't want me to. Yeah, I would love, you could, I, you definitely can. I, I would love to hear it. To whatever intrepid mystery hunter gets their hands on this book, my name is Dipper Pines. During my summer in the strange town of Gravity Falls, I've seen so many paranormal and baffling things that I could fill up an entire book. Lucky for me, and you, I found this cursed, empty old book in the attic of the Mystery Shack. There you go. I love that's... it. That's am- I think that's that's the first time I've ever heard a impression of me to me. Yeah, yeah. That's it amazing. is. It was very strange to be doing, <laughs> and then hearing the same voice <laughs> respond back to me. I'm like, a vocal I, mirror. I didn't like that at all. Why did I do that? <laughs> that's amazing. Oh my gosh. Well, thank you. I'm glad. I'm glad you enjoyed I it. Really you don't do. have to flatter me. Though. That is so cool. Yeah. No. I there were for sure. You can really hear the the most difference you can hear, and it's even kind of half and half is in the pilot episode um you know we went in and re-recorded yeah some you of the you stuff. said in the commentary oh you, yeah in the commentary, instead of yeah. going with nervous you were going with nerdy for yeah it was like the, the... Uh, taken or easy there was like a there was like a more yeah. nasally kind of thing that according that, to my calculations yeah, yeah. exactly <laughs> exactly and then i was like there's yeah, uh, look, you could be nerdy and not sound nerdy. I believe in Taurus Trapped, they use some of your takes from the unaired pilot, so it's like... Exactly, so we couldn't mix, go back and... Yeah, yeah. yeah interesting. And it's it's interesting to me also that you subconsciously had that it's a kid's show thing informing your performance, even though, like, you know, consciously you're obviously seeing that it was different and you were involved with the show, but you still had that kind of in your brain, and then by season two, you're like, all right, I get it. In season two, you only saw one set of footprints, and that's when Dipper was carrying you. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. That's exactly but right. But in season two, the the, the viewers are, are very brutally reminded that, like, yeah, we're, we're taking it up a notch a bit. We've got the the very gruesome zombies. We've got the, yeah. I mean, all of sock opera. Um, <laughs> everything <laughs> Bill Cipher does in that episode. Oh, my gosh. So and disturbing. we come to uh, Society of the Blind Eye, and it's uh, the pre- uh, there was a preview that came out that was really, really building this episode. And it seemed to have parallels with the leak we discussed earlier. Parallels with uh, the yes, that and the yeah, yeah and the the fan theory that emerged from that. Society of the Blind Eye is the seventh episode of Gravity Falls season two and the 27th episode overall. It premiered on October 27th, 2014 on Disney XD. It was directed by Sunil Hall, who, by the way, his first job in the industry was as a prop designer on, on My Life as a Teenage Robot. So. Whoa, I didn't know that. Small, Yeah, small Rob gave him his world. first job, and then yeah. uh, he's working with him again. That's awesome. And it was written by Matt Chapman, Alex Hirsch, and Zach Payette. Amazing. Wow. So, uh... We have the absolute joy of watching this episode with you. So why don't we go? Why don't we go watch it? I cannot wait. Or shall we unwatch it rather? <laughs> <laughs> oh. It could be the key to unlocking all the mysteries of Gravity Falls. This is the big one. Let's play it on the way. A massive conspiracy is unraveling. Are you seeing this? Exposing the mysteries of Gravity Falls. Throw with Blanchin. I live up in the mansion. Ugh, what is Blanchin? Know the real mysteries. Oh. Guys, look. When it's over, you'll know. So then that would mean wrote the journal? Gravity Falls, brand new next Monday night at 8.30 on Disney XD. Uh, so we just watched Society of the Blind Eye with Jason Ritter. This guy. This, this guy. guy. I'm very worried that if I quote Dipper, I'm going to slip into the impression <laughs> and it's still a little embarrassing to do. It's awesome. I love it. I hope it happens all the time. All right. You, gotta, you, got, you have to learn a Charlie Marlowe next. and then Okay. That's the deal. Yeah. <laughs> so off the bat, um, the, the promo for this episode that we just played, basically, <laughs> we thought maybe like spoiled the episode because basically there's a, there's a moment where Dipper, uh, in the context of the episode, is examining... Mabel, actually, is examining the, the laptop that 
that Bill smashed, and they see a thing that says McGucket Labs, and then they're realizing, <coughs> oh, maybe McGucket wrote the journals. And the line where Dipper says, old man McGucket wrote the journals, is in the promo, kind of like cut up and, and censored and bleeped out to give it a sense of mystery, but it's it's very clear what he's saying. Yeah. <laughs> it's very clear that he's saying, old man McGucket wrote the journals? <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> it's very easy to to figure that out, and so we going into this episode. A lot of people were like, "Did did they just spoil this?" Yeah. Um, turns out they were playing 4D chess. Yeah, that McGucket leak was a hoax. It was. Um, we were all out here playing checkers. I, I knew a little bit about it, um, and Alex showed me, but um, but he had the no, he had the internet and message boards know how to know where to drop it. For it to be picked up, like he he put it somewhere and deleted it. It was on the uh, the cartoon sub forum. Uh, I think it's called Co on uh, 4chan. Yeah, never go there. No, I don't. I don't. I'm scared of 4chan. No, don't don't do that. But uh, yeah, so he he went there and then tweeted that he was frustrated and then deleted the tweet. That's right. That's right. Uh, the, yeah, the tweet. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And he uh, not long after this <laughs> tweeted. I'll, I'll link it in the description of this episode tweeted uh a the kind of like the picture of the leak was this close up of a TV at the office and we now see a picture that is zoomed out with Alex with the most crap eating grin on his face <laughs> yeah. pointing finger guns at the at the screen and um the the text is uh, step 1 make hoax 2 upload to 4chan 3 post angry tweet about leak 4 delete tweet Five, let internet do rest. Yes. The top reply on this tweet is at Alex Hirsch. You are a terrible person. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I recall what the story was when Alex had noticed some fans starting to get close to figuring out the identity of the author. Yeah. Well, should we he say realized, mm, I, I, Should we say I, that? I, I, we have offered a hundred theories here from Waddles to, to Manly Dan. I am comfortable with it. <laughs> Franz. Franz. Franz was canon. We talked about that. Yeah. The, the golf ball. <laughs> Property yeah. of F. Franz, the little putty, yeah. of course. But, um, no, so, so there were some subsection of the fans that were starting to get a little close to kind of piecing some of it together and they realized they had no red herring they had clues to the actual solution but nothing else to throw people off their trail so there was like an emergency meeting and he called all the writers together and they discussed you know how to handle this moving forward and i think alex often gets a hundred percent credit for this leak because uh he's in the picture and he's the one that actually went on 4chan but it sounds, from what I can gather, that it was a group effort from the writer's room. Joe Pitt did the drawing, I believe. It does, it, yeah, okay, that makes sense. It looks like a Joe Pitt. The image was sketched initially by Alex and fully drawn and finished by Joe Pitt. It's just, it's so amazing that it, like, it was, it was all to preserve the mystery. There was no, it wasn't like an episode, it was just extra work for everybody, <laughs> and but they all, like, were game to do and it. And so, Jason... You were mentioning that you thought about uh, the Gobblewonker as something that McGucket was proven to have constructed by himself. Yeah, and... I thought. I mean, I thought when I first saw that episode, I thought it was sort of random, and I thought it was kind of funny. And I, I kind of again, I, I was thinking of it. I was thinking of it as a cartoon where you know the coyote falls off the cliff and then he's fine again the next day. Like there, there there's no sort yeah. of through line. There's it's a just, flexible reality. Yes, ex- exactly. Yeah. So when it got to this episode and I realized that he was a brilliant scientist and it <laughs> made it even sadder that you know you get his whole story. You get that he's he had this future. He had this life, and then he yeah, got massive, derailed. Massive revelation. It's, it's incredibly mm-hmm. sad. Yeah, we watch a man's life fall apart before our yeah. eyes in this season episode. Season two, in all, I think overall has this trend of turning "quote unquote" joke characters into real characters, more serious characters, more genuine characters. At- we saw it a little with uh, Pacifica and Gulf War. Yeah, she exactly. Kind of yeah, gets yeah. Fleshed out into a person rather than a bleach bond. Yeah, Valley yeah, Girl, Girl stereotype. stereotype. It has the side effect, though, of making everything else really sad in hindsight. Feral, this idea of McGucket is like this feral possum-like creature 
is now just depressing. Like yeah. it used to be really funny. I know. Uh, and it's like he he. It's like this guy. This guy has a doctorate. Yeah. 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 And now he's like he built that robot because. That destroyed half of the no city. No one, because, yeah, because someone wouldn't hang yeah, out. Yeah, exactly. So <laughs> yeah. It's, it's still like all that information is still in there, and just the idea that his brain is so well, far Well, specifically gone that his son wouldn't hang out. I with know. Him. Well, and the, that his son is, uh, you know, around, he still lives in the dump. It's, you know, his son. Mm hmm. Yeah, it's. I, I, I it's guess. It's depressing. This is <laughs> really a depressing is. show. It is kind of all there from his first appearance. There is a, a hint of sadness, although in that episode, it's. Uh, you know, the cherry on top is just, I'm going to build a death ray, you know, like he's still a cartoon. <laughs> when I was going through season one, I thought absolutely the, the Gobblewonker robot was to establish McGucket as a, a, a scientist. I think so. Like yeah. I thought now in hindsight, but yeah. no, it, it wasn't. Oh, they had no idea of doing the McGucket red herring at that point. That yeah, they didn't so know why funny. they gave him a cast. That's they, were like, they didn't know why they gave him a cast. They didn't know why they made him good at building robots. This just they found this as they went. The cast trial the, by the fire. The cast element is brilliant because he's always had that. It on is. His arm, and so I was like, did he lose the sixth finger in a some kind of robot accident? Did he intentionally cut it off to preserve oh, his yeah, identity? Exactly. For those who are just listening to the podcast and haven't seen the show in like ten years. Uh, hi, Kyle. But also, <laughs> the uh, eventual reveal is that he was the author's assistant. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, an insult to injury on the the leaked picture. At the top of the image, the, the episode code in the A1Z26 cipher translates to ALX. Oh, wow. Just basically like, yep, this was me. This was us. <laughs> Although I would make the argument that, exp have, you know, Again, the whole purpose of this podcast is that this fandom is a uh, an irreplaceable experience. We're trying to document, preserve it, get give people who weren't there a sense of what it was like. And I think having experienced this leak arguably enhances the experience of the episode because they were making it with this red herring in mind. And we see the characters experience the red herring in real time, in a way. Like, we have that same, like... Literally, like, you know, we were, Jason, we were like, yeah, like, Jason was just literally doing the, the corkboard thing, too, yeah. like, Dipper, you know, with, like, the, he is connecting the dots literally with all of the, like, the cast and the name, Fiddleford is one of the only F names, yeah. Property of F, yeah. And, and the, the, the fact that Fiddleford's name is only said at one point in the entire series up until this point, and mm -hmm. it's in a post-credits joke bit where he eats a giant check. Oh, yeah. Yeah. To know that Property of F was alluding to Fiddleford, you would have to remember the scene from Little Dipper during the credits where he eats a check, and sometimes if you were watching this on TV, you might not see the credits bit. You might just tune out before then. You might or, just... or sometimes they would, like, mute them and start playing the next show in the programming. Oh, yeah, they'd minimize them kind of in the screen. And... Huh. Yeah. Yeah, so it is, it is I think, as disheartening as it was at the time, because some of us were like, did the entire show just get spoiled by this <laughs> yeah. leak? But... It really turned out to I make experiencing this episode better and deeper and like more of a of a wow like because at the end it's like okay you weren't the author but you worked with him still feels like a win still feels like it's a big piece of the puzzle I mean even to know that yeah. that laptop I think it's the biggest piece of the puzzle we have received in the entire show thus far yeah because we have a direct connection to the author. He can't remember, but he knows who the author is somewhere deep in there. Who wrote the journal is a question posited in episode one. This is episode 27 <laughs> yeah. when we finally get a clue. Exactly. Yeah. A, a much more significant clue. Like, we've had a decently steady streak. Yeah. You know, in the bunker, we got some clues in there. And here we just get this big dump of, of revelations, not only about McGucket, but about the machine uh, yeah. in the basement of the Mystery Shack. And the whole town, all of the townspeople as well, because, you know, the, the titular society of the blind eye was a huge, like, that's been teased since, uh, actually, Jason, uh, do you know where they, where we first, uh, learned about them? Was, was it in the end cards? Was it that, that was the, uh, was, was in the, okay, it was in the end cards of what? Like the end cards of the, of each episode, there was like six different. Not, not, not the, the shorts. Oh, the shorts. That's, of the shorts. That's what yeah. it was. Yeah, that's right. So yes, 
it, that's when we first saw the symbol, but the first time we saw the word blind eye was in the end credits cryptogram of oh, the season right. one finale, Gideon, Gideon Rises. Rises. Oh, that's right. Gideon Rises was 2013. This was 2014, nearly a year later where we get the payoff. Finally finding out what the blind eye is. Amazing. Well, over, over a year later. Yeah. yeah. And it works really cohesively, like, like you said, Jason, because as much as, you know, they didn't necessarily have everything planned out from the outset 100%, but they made everything fit in a way that doesn't feel like a retcon. You know, it feels like it could have been planned all along. Well, and it's also, it's Um, also nice because I, you know, it's like kind of one of those things where you, you start to think there's a merman living in the pool. There are these manatars out in the woods. Yeah. (laughs) Nobody has noticed any of this before. How is everyone so blase about it? it, Yeah. it's, It's like, it's it it helps too in that like yes Dipper and Mabel are discovering all of these things and nobody seems to know about it or you know yeah um, and this is why they've all had their memories wiped. Actually, hey, you know what? Not only so the blind eye, yes, that was over a year ago at this point, but even further back than that, in the game Rumble's Revenge is when we first got the secret code telling us that there's a secret society in Gravity Falls. Oh, whoa. I want to say that was late 2012. Oh, my gosh. So that was like two years before this, that we first got the inkling that there's the secret society. And I love that not only, like you said, that it explains like, it explains why everyone is, uh, why everyone in Gravity Falls acts like Springfield, like why everyone is, is kind of (laughs) weird, kind of off. And, um, that they've had their minds just constantly erased every time they <laughs> encounter something supernatural as a method of, like, protection. So it's, like, it's interesting, too, yeah. the morality of their their doings is, like, they have a reason, but by their own admission, they've taken it way too far. They're like, yeah, yeah, we use it a lot. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> well, and that, that the majority of... Gravity Falls residents are walking around with huge holes in their yeah, memory yeah. and don't even kind of know, but just like, wasn't there, oh, today's Tuesday? Yeah. Gosh. I mean, it's that's, <laughs> you know? that's the whole theme of the episode is like painful reality versus blissful ignorance. And I think that's a really interesting way to explore that idea um, with a literal memory eraser that... It's implied to maybe be, like, addictive, or maybe, like, it reveals a lot about how the machine works, how this device works, the the mind eraser gun, where you you type whatever you want to forget in, and then you just blast yourself, but it has this, like, degenerative (laughs) effect on... I I love that it dispenses little glass vials with paper on them, but they're also videotapes for some reason. It's very steampunk. I know. Yeah, yeah. It's very old fashioned, <laughs> yeah. very, very, very McGucket in a way. And, and also, I mean, I'm totally. The, uh, a- and the, uh, the tubes that they travel through is like a, a 70s Hydraulic. or 60s. Yeah. I yeah. love those yeah. tubes. Not only we get the reveal that he was the author's assistant, but that he invented this device and he was the yeah, founder yeah. of the society. Yes, exactly. Yes. We get revelations we didn't even know we wanted. On top of all of this, uh, townspeople that we have known this whole time are, are the, you know, make up the society. It isn't a hundred percent like new characters because you know that would feel a, a little cheap to just have it be entirely people we've never heard of, but to have it be people that we've you know seen around and including again joke characters who now have a part to play. The guy who married a woodpecker in Irrational Treasure and uh, Toby determined Tats Tats the bouncer. Uh, Gideon's dad, yeah, yep, Gideon's yeah. dad, uh, Bud Gleeful. He's not a joke character. He's, he's the... a pretty like significant, uh, you know, dad of a of a very yeah. uh, important villain. And Sprout. And I want to know how much, like, what, like, what's, you know, there's we don't get to know Gideon's mom that well, but something's gone. Well, on there was a tube with her name on it. Yeah, there's a tube with her name on it. Oh yeah, there's exactly, a tube with yeah. a lot of names, which we'll get into later, but um. Yeah, so the leader uh, is a new character. Mm-hmm. Uh, Blind Ivan. And now known as Toot Toot McBurnsnazzle. Yes. No, you're right. I, should, I shouldn't I should dead name him. <laughs> yeah, you're right. Yeah, so he is 
Voiced by Peter Serafinowicz. Voiced wonderfully by Peter Serafinowicz. Oh, so, uh... Uh, he's probably best known as playing Pete in Shaun of the Dead. No, that's not true. But, okay, I, I say he is because in the commentary, uh, obviously Rob Renzetti knows that as he has established um, Shaun of the Dead as one of his favorite it's movies. Shaun of the Deadhead, yeah. Yep, but when Alex says he's also the voice of Darth Maul, Rob sounds confused. <laughs> Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah. He is the voice of Darth Maul for three lines. Three lines, yes. Really? I didn't know that. In the Phantom yeah, Menace. In, in yeah, in the Phantom Menace. And the Phantom Menace alone. So not in not in Solo. Ray, Ray Park uh, is the body of Darth Maul. The voice is uh, Peter. I did not know that. Possibly yeah. my favorite George Lucas story ever. <laughs> Mine too. I said to George, as I called him, I said, uh, <laughs> I said... Uh, uh, what, uh, how do you want me to do this? What, what direction can you give me? And he said, just make him evil. Just make him sound <laughs> real evil. <laughs> uh, all right, okay. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> just make yeah. him sound evil. Just make it like, make, make oh, so what real evil. kind of like, <laughs> and you know, obviously, you know, Jason, you have experience with this of like voice direction is a very specific kind of thing. You, you need like, yeah. yeah. So that's kind of like, not a very productive note. Um, Imagine that in this universe, you've gone through your whole childhood with the first name Darth. Okay, well, <laughs> <laughs> you've had these horns growing out of your head. Imagine you you look like the Christian Satan, and your name is Maul. <laughs> yeah, how would that make you feel? To his credit, to Peter's credit, he does sound evil. He does sound he does. really evil. Yeah, he, he made really him, does. He made him sound real evil. I think, and uh, I also think it's hilarious that. Shaun of the Dead came up in Scarioke because we asked Rob what his favorite zombie media was because he directed that. And oh yeah, if I had a nickel for every time we had to talk about Shaun of the Dead with someone, <laughs> welcome to our Shaun of the Dead podcast where we have guests who worked on Gravity Falls for some reason. Just talk about Shaun of the Dead. I mean, I would. I admit he can be pretty funny on occasion. At like that time, we stayed up all night drinking apple schnapps and playing Tekken too. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> when was that? That was five years ago. When's he going home? Yeah, in the commentary, Alex says that... I, I remember um, him bringing his child to the record, and he was in Britain, so he was, you know, we were doing it remotely. Yeah. Um, but I remember he said, uh, you know, oh, I'm happy to do the show. It's, uh, for my, um, it's for my son here. Say hello, Sam. And I heard this cute little British kid go, I love Gravity Force. <laughs> <laughs> and it was like the most satisfying did moment. You, did you picture him like with coal on his cheeks? And, uh, Please, I'm and, starving. Uh, yeah. give, me, give me porridge. <laughs> I'm a chimney sweep, I am. And then when the first thing you did when you got on a remote call with us was show us your child, I was like, which are cinematic parallels. <laughs> and he's the tick, isn't he? He's the new. Yes, he's the he's tick the in tick, the, yeah. the Amazon Prime series. But Amazon Prime doesn't advertise their shows, so people don't know that. He's also in Guardians of the Galaxy. Oh, yeah. He says a holes. He's, he's the so one who, who calls them what a bunch of a holes. Yeah. Love him. He's such a good actor. He's really underutilized because, like, those are big roles, but like he doesn't have many other big roles. Oh god, there's he also has a YouTube thing that he does that's so funny. Yes, where he where he uh dubs Trump in weird accents. Oh, that's right. That's what it is. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But he his voice is so incredible and no, his, he's his, great his line readings yeah. in this episode. You won't feel like wah for much long. <laughs> he really made the antagonist of this episode sound evil, sound, sound real, real evil. Yeah, he did. He's, he's really taken that note to heart. And he says the Gravity falls he lines, which is something I love about most of their, their antagonists, is that they can be really threatening and really funny at the same time. Because he's there's the like wah, and then my favorite is, what about McGucket? He talks to animals because of what you did. Don't you feel bad? And he's like, maybe a little. The way oh, he yeah. just goes, mm, that... the drawing that accompanies it is really good. <laughs> yeah. And so the design good. of Blind Ivan, um, his, the tattoos on his head are based on phrenology, which, uh, is, was, hopefully was. I hope no, I hope no one's still practicing. Yeah, it was. It's a pseudoscience that basically. It's, it's like, a, it's like a, a hot topic or East meets West thing now. Gotcha. It's very twee. They thought that it was, is that they thought this is where the, like, they... They thought that head shape determined it's personality. It's kind of a, um, it's like the humors of the blood. It's like, ah, yes. Yes, this. but it's, it's, it's the proportion. So there's a part of your forehead that, um, 
Like, like my forehead looks, uh, judging by this picture, slightly bigger than your guys. Are you talking about the, I don't know, is that what this is? Yes, that's what phrenology is, is the belief that the proportions that make up your head determine the aspects of your personality and understanding of the world. Oh, I always thought that it was like how, like, uh, you know how, like, there's the pictures of, like, cows and it's like pork, lo- or like, not pork. Yeah, line, it's guess, divided cow, up into like, sections. Is so like... It's like, this is the part of your brain that thinks about. Sex or... That would be good too if it, if if I got a if I got a prime cut of like creative or whatever. Right. <laughs> yeah, I think it is. It is both like the surface of the brain and also the and it's also completely made. It up. is. <laughs> I mean, yeah. yeah. We we you wrote pseudoscience here. It was something that real scientists believed at one point because they were just taking shots in the dark. Brains complicated. Exactly. It's that trend of like, like I said with the humors. It's like ah yes this. This biological thing clearly has some sort of impact on your moral character. I love character. your old-timey doctor <laughs> voice, Ella. That should be that should be your next animation. Yes, as you can see with my with this caliper uh, <laughs> yeah. that I have, a lot of calipers. Cali- there were a lot of calipers. Um, what happened to caliper? Can we bring back calipers? Can we bring back calipers, but not in like a racist way? You know, I, I don't want to get too deep into this uh, with a guest that I don't know very well. But talking about McGucket and his you know, mm-hmm. his downturn and his, you know, over-reliance on the memory-erasing device, etc. Um, there's this fantastic comic that I'm going to link um, that does have spoilers for the show as well as for the Journal 3 that released, which you're supposed to read after the whole show. So, yeah, major spoilers there, but it does connect to the episode in that it draws a parallel with uh, obsessive compulsive disorder, uh, which is something I experience, and McGucket's, uh, you know, he has these things that he can't stop thinking about. Whatever he saw, which is another thing that is revealed, that something terrible happened something to traumatic. the machine, yeah. and he cannot stop thinking yeah. about it. Yeah. And, you know, how OCD tends to work is that you have an obsession that you know, you can't stop thinking about it, so you need to do a compulsion to keep the thought at bay. And the compulsion in this comic is labeled as the the memory eraser. Which I think is why this episode is so depressing for us. We're like, no, I don't want yeah, to do that. Yeah, and it's... This is a post by uh, ginjuicetonic.tumblr.com, which I'll link. Um, and it's like, you know, talking about the gnomes. I came across some guys who shouldn't exist. Can I trust my eyes? Can I trust my mind? And then I hit another car today. What if I died? What if they died? And then it's this, the compulsion over and over again of erasing his memory over and over. And, uh, you know, I again, I don't want to put this person's stuff out there either, but also it's like, you know, it's a public post. It's not a, a vent post. So I imagine it is to be shared, and I'm sharing it yeah. because it had that meaning to me in that way as well. And I think that's just what really makes the theme work for me of like, because that's the whole thing with OCD treatment is um, accepting the uncertainty, mm-hmm. like not mm. relying on silencing the thoughts, which is being like, all right, yeah, this is a thought. This Absolutely. will pass. Yeah. And um, there's this subplot with Mabel uh, where she wants to, you know, she well, actually um, it's, it's set off by the, update on Miranda. <laughs> yeah. Dear Mabel, so far so good. It is with a heavy heart, so far so good, that I must inform you, I'm getting married! And there it is. In order to prevent an undersea civil war, arranged wedding, queen of the manatees, and she's so beautiful! Did you ever, I know, I'm sure you've been asked this before, did you ever record directly with Kristen? Like, maybe two or three times. And, and there was one time where we got to, it was, it was, uh... With Thurup. It was, yeah, it was, it was Kristen and Thurup and I for a Hand That Rocks the Mabel. Kristen was in New York and I was in Los Angeles when we started. And then she came to LA and I went to New York. So it was very rare that we were all in the same place. Then she moved for, uh... Last Man on Earth, right? Yes, exactly, yeah. It was Tyler the Cute Biker that, that got her to, to record in person with you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there you get go. It. <laughs> get it. Get <laughs> it. Get him. It's too bad he wasn't one of the society. He would yeah. never. <laughs> He's a good boy. No, he doesn't. Yeah, that's right. He likes remembering things. He yeah. likes yeah. remembering stuff. seeing Manly Dan beat stuff up. Yeah. That was so, that, it was so exciting to like see all the incredible people who came on and did like a voice on the show. I mean, you know, 
and there's a lot of Jennifer Coolidge in this episode too, and she was just so great and. You know, some of her line readings. You a big Legally Blonde fan? I, well, I was a huge fan of hers from the ground. Oh, yeah, yeah. My friends and I would go see their shows and, you know, she just was always so brilliant. Did you ever take any Groundlings classes? I never did. Um, oh, you could have fooled me. Oh, well, thank you very much. <laughs> I, I, I took UCB classes. Oh, cool. <laughs> so we're, we're arch nemesis. <laughs> no, no, I also went to UCB shows. I'm a, I, oh, we okay. Like okay. I, thought you were about to, I thought this was like a, like a, like a West Side Story thing was about to happen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, the, yeah. The, the Groundlings and the Upright Citizens Brigade. <laughs> yeah. And let's throw, let's throw Second City in the mix. Let's make it a three-way turf war. Exactly. Oh, no. <laughs> exactly. All right. Well, so I, as I mentioned, you know, my entire experience of getting into media production, of understanding what happens behind the scenes was the commentaries on the Homestar Runner DVDs and Matt Chapman, who created that web series that Alex Hirsch watched in college, voices Mermondo and voices like half of the blind eye members part of this when they're robed here. Yeah, and, and wrote uh, like an early draft of this episode and Unsee You Later comes from that. So it's like, I got into this show because i was <laughs> do you think mcsuckett is also from that <laughs> <laughs> might be it's like something strong bad would say oh god i'm sorry that was so good mabel is very sad because mermando's getting married to the to the beauty i mean gorgeous i know i love Queen that you know, she's so beautiful it's so sweet she's just the it's best very, character because it's genuine yeah yeah it's she's not, not yeah she's like happy for him but dealing with her own broken heart and, and she's a little jealous of, her, of course I mean, look at her how can she compete no with i her? just meant the the she's so beautiful thing isn't like uh no it wasn't sarcastic no yeah she's, um, she's no mabel believes she's it. happy for him she's happy for them but it's painful because she loved him. Same with what I feel was, I mean, it, it was out of character for Seuss, but it was very in character for Wendy and Mabel when he, he insults uh, Lazy Susan's mascara and they jump on She's him immediately. <laughs> I, I think she looks beautiful. <laughs> yeah. He's just, oh, yeah. touched a nerve. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Wendy ends up, we have a kind of a bonding with, with Wendy and Mabel as I she love is that moment. Yeah. depressed over all of the, the failed summer romances she's experienced and uh and again painful reality blissful ignorance she is very tempted to erase her own mind and it's like how would you how would you learn you would get stuck in a cycle um like mcgucket does and <laughs> wendy is actually stressed 24 <laughs> 7 yeah i know that's a surprise uh thing in the episode but uh... no it, not for me because i know so many people who remind me of wendy actually one of them just messaged me uh so oh, nice. i know that uh that that's how it tends to Be go kind that to that the wendy's in your life sometimes internal <laughs> anguish manifests as uh cool calm uh, collected in, in adhd it's called low arousal theory oh um, which is the idea that if your brain is constantly active, your body slows down to compensate for it, and that's why uh, a lot of people with my condition get considered lazy. Oh, whoa! <laughs> and it makes sense that uh, we see what we've seen of Manly Dan around the house and the, the Wendy's brothers. They accidentally crushed a, a building with a tree. <laughs> yeah, and then yeah, which seemed to be like their shed or a cabin Manly they Dan were is too big for his own house and keeps breaking. <laughs> yeah. st- the structural integrity of the house. Yeah, exactly. put that wall there. So you know, it's just it's nice to like with uh, Into the Bunker. It's nice to see Wendy on an adventure with the group. And this is one She's of our so first cool. times of 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 Wendy Mabel bonding. Um, yep. Well, we got it, it a little, a lot. And briefly. I, and, a little. Uh, Advice. I said one of our first. Hello, <laughs> Charles. Uh, <laughs> I chose my words carefully, <laughs> very precise. Um, speaking of. Choosing words very precisely. Yes. You notice how rappers are such visionaries? <laughs> so yes, Ella flew to California to go to the D23 Expo, waited in line. I had a very important question for Alex Hirsch. Waited in line? How long was that line? Okay, well, yeah, I will relate it to your experience from the previous episode of getting the Dipper and Mabel's Guide book signed, because I was one of the first to get there, because... It didn't seem like it was very uh, advertised. I had to kind of dig up to be like, are you sure that this is like... As, I was oppo- there. as opposed to the Goofy movie thing, which everyone knew about the second it was announced. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, because that was like the 20th anniversary of, of the Goofy movie uh, that year. I love that movie. We all and, love yeah. that movie. <laughs> 
It's a great Let's movie. Let's just stop this and do a bonus hey, podcast about Goofy, goofy movie. Movie. Yeah. <laughs> They've been laughing since I can't remember. But they're not going to laugh, laugh anymore. Do <laughs> no, no, you uh, need a break from modern living? <laughs> do you long yes. to shed your weary load? Oh, so good. So, Straight Blanchin by Lil Big Dog is the, the featured rap in this uh, episode that Seuss loves. It's the it's the song of the summer. Am I Blanchin, girl, we Blanchin. I live up in a mansion. Am I Blanchin, girl, we Blanchin. I live up in a mansion. Wendy uh, hates it because Blanchin, she doesn't understand what Blanchin is. And you didn't Am either, I, so you got no, on an airplane. It was the biggest unsolved mystery of Gravity Falls. <laughs> bigger got, than any of these other you, weak to mysteries. To solve this mystery, you boarded an aeroplane. Yes. A, a <laughs> flying vehicle arrived on the on co- the other side of the country on the, uh, uh, near the pacific ocean you waited in line and then what okay ha- actually yes context <laughs> throughout the convention this was like the saturday or the sunday um he sits on the edge of his seat like, i so i, I want to know i it's a, a good big mystery for me too <laughs> there was this uh set up little uh like a stage it, it was um it might have been the same one that they did when you did that commercial for the journal. Oh, okay. They yeah. had like this little set that was like the mystery shack. I think it's the same. It looks the same set. in the in the video you sent me. Yeah. So it was a li- it was there uh, all weekend, and we kept walking by it, and I was like, you know, I got pictures in front of it. It was like nobody there. It wasn't like blocked off or anything. So we were just like, uh, okay, this is this is just here. Um, interesting. And there was like a blurb on one of the the guides to the events of like, oh yeah, so there's a panel with so and so, and there'll be a signing or whatever. And like, there was a panel with uh, Alex Hirsch, Darren Nefsey, the creator of Star vs. the Forces of Evil. I want to say Craig McCracken was that somebody was there talking about Wander Over Yonder. It would be and weird if someone... it wasn't Craig. Just some guy. <laughs> I yeah, I don't know, but I feel like I would have freaked out more if it was Craig McCracken. <laughs> and then uh, there was someone talking about uh, pickle and peanut. I believe that was a show at the uh, time. Yeah. This was, I want to say, after that panel. Maybe not directly, but one way or another, I was there like maybe an hour before uh, there was anything supposed to go on because I didn't know where Alex was going to be, but I knew that if there was going to be a signing. I knew where it would be. It would be at that place that looked like the mystery shack. (laughs) So I bolted there, and I was one of the first there. And then there were other people, you know, there were maybe three other people at a time uh, after after a few minutes, and we just started talking about Gravity Falls. We played Heads Up while we waited. That was when that was a thing. You know, Heads Up. Yep, I love that game. Played the app game uh, while we waited in line. Oh, I I thought you were talking about... um... Heads Up 7. Yeah, Yeah, I was like... But you were talking about the phone on your head. Oh, okay. yeah. Not this one. Yeah, we played that for a bit while we waited. We kind of, you know, we just chatted about Gravity Falls. I think they might have been also in cosplay or had their Dipper hats because I was in cosplay. I was I was in Dipper cosplay. Now, wait. Um, now, I, I've, I've only seen the video from first person perspective and the whole time you're talking to Alex in your Seuss voice. So I didn't realize that this is a almost close enough to play uh, accurate age Dipper in Dipper's clothes. And then Seuss's exact voice comes out of her. That's amazing. And I knew that's what I was going to do when I got there, but we were waiting. And then, again, like with your experience at New York Comic Con, the line gradually started to stretch because the convention uh, organizers did not realize how big this fandom was. It, you know, I would, I saw like a, I saw a Robbie cosplayer way back there. I was like, wow, this is, this is real. And uh, one person there, don't know if it was that line elsewhere in the weekend was dressed as not Seuss oh my gosh. from Gideon Rises, yeah. which was fantastic. There was a melody there. Nice. I live for really niche cosplays. Me too. I, there was a Me Grunkle too. Stan with Waddles in the Huggy Wuggy tummy bundle oh uh, carrier. One time, um, Ella and I ran a photo shoot for a bunch of cosplayers at a different convention, and I like don't feel I look like any Gravity Falls character, but I talk about Gravity Falls a lot and have a goatee, so people are like, you kind of look like Alex Hirsch, and I don't really. But and he I has bought one a, outfit. I bought a flannel shirt for me and Ella's photo. <laughs> That's all you need. It's a red and black flannel. We waited there uh, probably an hour, and then Alex got there, and again, like your experience at New York, uh, they were like, okay, uh, because there are way more people than we thought, you can't uh, ask Alex for anything specific, no personal 
photos with Alex, so I just had, you know, recording going as I was going up, um, because I needed to know, what does Blanchin mean? And I walked up in my, in a Seuss voice. And let's play the clip! I have one question. Absolutely. What's like the definition of Blanchin? I've been wondering that all summer. I looked it up, and apparently Blanchin means to steam a vegetable, thus removing its color and flavor. Huh. Not as cool as the rap songs make it sound. <laughs> That's amazing. And then he made Ella promise that she will never do that voice to any Disney executives because he, he does not want to get fired. fired from his own show. <laughs> he then, amazing. uh... The si- the thing that I got him to sign was the so the original DVD that came out with just like six episodes. Oh on yeah, it yeah. Had a had a little mini replica journal, so he signed right on the, the property of page, oh, and he drew a little Seuss. Awesome. I guess I'll, I'll I'll get a photo for the description. He drew a little Seuss, and it said like, <laughs> I can't really read what he. I think wrote. he wrote real big dog rules. Oh, uh, was it rules? I always read it as forget, which would be appropriate <laughs> given the episode that it appears in. But um, so that was. That was my journey. That was my trek That's to find amazing. out what Blanche Your means. journal we, journey. My journal journey. We made some friends along the way, and, and we learned a thing or two and about Blanche. Now I finally yeah. know. I can put it to rest. I know. You Sorry, can finally so sleep again. <laughs> I can. You were doing the, uh, but what does Blanching mean? Oh, yeah. <laughs> but who? I has to be more than just a rhyme for mansion. So, the end of this episode. Um, you want to talk about... The little, little, little thing well, well, happens Jay- at the end, Jason, Jason seems to know exactly what it was, yeah. so even though we have it written here and could just read that, I want to force him to wing it. When Stan activates the portal and a mug, a pen, and a notebook ah. get sucked in, what happened yes. to those objects? Well, you, uh, if you had a very close eye and a, a certain I don't know actually the name of the episode but close Rick counters of the Rick kind it is the season one finale or penultimate well there you yeah. go so yeah those three objects they they reappear in an episode of Rick and Morty and as far as I know that was not something that was really like went through the proper channels or was approved by either show. It was like uh they they just were friends and they they were yeah. like, Can we do this thing and connect yeah. these two universes? Yeah, no, uh I don't I don't actually know what studio animates Rick and Morty, but yeah, no, uh if there was a mug going into a portal in the storyboards, Rough Draft wasn't gonna be like, uh uh-uh, uh, no way Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um. No one would would question it, but Alex Hirsch and Justin Roiland, you know, being old friends. The wild thing to me about this is not. I don't know, you know, what the real intention was as far as the airing, because obviously, once an episode is produced, it's out of their hands. You know, it's up to the network to air it. But Close Rick Counters of the Rick Kind aired in April of 2014. This episode aired in October. The crossover, in a way, happens in reverse because in Gravity Falls is when they. Enter the portal. In Rick and Morty, the question mark mug, the pen, and the notepad Fly out. fall out of a portal yeah. in the background. And I was like, watching that episode of Rick and Morty, I was like, why, did, why does that mug have a question mark on it? It looks like it's from the Mystery no, Shack. It's just, Is that like a Gravity Falls? It's just a question mark block from Mario. You know, you know how much <laughs> yeah. Justin yeah. loves Nintendo. But, you know, because at that point we'd already known, you know, Justin Merlin was Blendin and all these other... Yeah, yeah. They, they'd worked together on fish hooks. We knew there was a, a relationship with them, and... Apparently, uh, the reason Jackie Buscarino was considered for Pacifica is because uh, Alex listened to Justin Merlin's podcast that she was a co-host on. Oh, no way! I yeah. didn't know that. That's amazing. But yeah, I was like, you know, I was like, what, what, what is that? And I didn't really think anything of it, but then, you know, when this happened, I was like, Holy crap. Okay, got it. Got it. Okay. That's amazing. So <laughs> that you actually clo- everything. you clocked it on in Rick and Morty. You were like, what was that? Cl- in the I don't know if I clocked it. I was just like, that's Yeah, so there are mugs that look like that that are like in the background art of the gift shop sometimes. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. So Ella being uh, a bigger Gravity Falls fan than a Rick and Morty fan recognized it immediately. That's amazing. So I was just like, oh, okay, that's and I, there were people who were thinking deeper on it than I was, because I was, you know, again, not really that into Rick Thinking and Morty. deeper or um, thinking dipper? I was thinking pretty <laughs> dipper. Um, we checked back in on that on that machine in the basement of the Mystery Shack at the yeah. end of this episode, which uh, we haven't seen it since Scary Oki. Um, and Stan talks about it getting stronger. Yeah, I, I, we ha- you're right, we hadn't seen it since Scary Oki. You know what? I missed it, but my aim is getting better. 
<laughs> Stan's aim is getting better too. I mean, though that stuff went right into Rick and Morty. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I know if he had if he had gotten the angle slightly wrong, who knows what show <laughs> would have been straight into Adventure Time. <laughs> um, I guess it also does further prove that it is indeed a portal because it goes through. Yeah, you know, it, it passes out of another portal because mm-hmm. we weren't really sure. McGucket just calls it a machine. Yeah. They allude to it being a portal in cryptograms. Cryptograms, right. Oh, but yeah. not directly. Um, but, uh, I no, yeah, it's a portal. Every day it's getting stronger. I would go as far as to say this is a triumph. I'm making a note right here. Oh, nope, your notebook's gone. Oh. <laughs> and your pen, and your mug. And my pen. Presumably all the coffee that was in it is well. it's gone. <laughs> so. Oh, no, Stan um, drank that hours ago and was just still carrying it. He's disgusting. Yeah. <laughs> Got his spittle Just in know it. Where to put it down. Yeah. <laughs> well, there's a lot of important technology in there that he doesn't really understand. <laughs> yeah. Um, that is a very exciting ending. I was, you know, anytime they started to like go back into the main, you know, into something they'd introduced or the. So you knew about the, that scene because you see the whole script. I see the whole script and I knew that it was, that there was, that more was coming. I still didn't know what he was up to. I still didn't know. Anything. Um, but, you know, I was I was just happy that, like, we were getting to see what was behind the vending machine that we saw in episode one. What did you think was behind the vending machine? I, I had no idea. I mean, Me I neither. really just had yeah. no idea. I just, it was like, what is he doing? Is this, it, it seemed high tech. So it yeah. wasn't like a bookcase, like, oh, it's a secret room where he just goes to, like, gotcha. have some yeah, quiet it's not time. A, it was like, yeah. some, he's doing something back there. Be careful, though, guys, because uh, there are there are some zoning restrictions about where we can and can't talk about uh, fan theories. Oh, that's right. That's right. Jason, we have a, uh, a designated has, hallway. Yeah. Um, yeah. The, the, yeah. No, landlord rules, uh, city restrictions. Yeah. So we actually have a hall of conspiracies where it is safe and appropriate to talk about I these see. sort of things. Okay. So why don't we go into that segment? Yeah, will you follow us? Yes. Let's, Let's go. go to the Hall of Conspiracies. Ladies and gentlemen, right this way to the Hall of Conspiracies. Okay, so what do you think of the place? Beautiful. It's nice. And it's I cozy. love the song. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I yeah. Know, that was, right? uh, that was by our awesome. friend uh, Sim in the Dim Bulb. It is a remix of our first episode. Uh, you can it. find it at a link in the description, actually, if you want to hear more of it. I, I definitely yeah. will. So, what's your experience of watching, you know, this episode or just an episode when it airs, as versus like knowing that you worked on it months and months prior? It's it's kind of the best. It, it's it's sort of my favorite thing about animation. Um, you know, when when I when I do something that's live action or something, I I watch it and I go, oh yeah, I remember that. I remember being there. I remember seeing yeah. that. You know, maybe there Physical was a muscle some memory. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Whereas as a doing a voiceover, you you like go into a booth. It's a very lonely thing. <laughs> and then you—I mean, it's not lonely. There are other people around, not in the same room, but observing you through glass. Yeah, <laughs> like exactly. a, like an animal at a zoo. Like an animal yeah. at a zoo. Um, but you you sort of you 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 put your voice in this little bubble and send it out into the world, and then it has its own complete adventure that <laughs> yeah. that you weren't a part oh, of. Oh and... yeah, uh, we used to we used to do a lot of improv videos together and sometimes people will just quote me to me and i'll be like i know my phrasing enough to know that that's probably something i, Same, I yeah, said I'm always like did i say when that? or why yeah. did, would i have said something like that yeah. yeah it's really it's it's amazing well and you know at the end of uh, you know every recording there you know there is a time where you have to go like Ugh, ah Ah, oh, the effort noises, you know, yeah. Like yeah. And then, effort so noises see, and walla. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so to just, and also to hear the other people and to see what it's all about. And then, especially this with the mystery, like there are all these, there are visual clues that either I didn't pick up when I was reading through because it's just like a stage I, direction. I don't remember yeah. that Alex it was either a, a stage direction or incident. just didn't exist until the boarding process. Exactly, and so yeah, it, it was joke so exciting, and just I remember just in the in the period of time when they would air, getting ready, you know, on the night that they were gonna 
Yeah, it's always an event, event it was, television. It really was. And and I, and then like going on Twitter and seeing what people were saying mm-hmm, and, mm-hmm, wa- and mm-hmm. seeing who solved it first and trying to like not spoil before I cracked the code because I, I like doing that uh, until I, at the beginning of this season where I really was yeah. like, what is, what's Got happening? Very difficult. I don't know. What's, yeah. This is nothing like I've ever heard of before. During season um, two, I had a tradition just to make it feel even more like an event is, well, I am constantly craving pizza. I'm from New Jersey. It's normal. Or I'm from I love the pizza. New York city new jersey border um but i made it so i would only ever eat pizza when watching a new gravity falls episode nice. interesting <laughs> that's good pavlovian response yeah we do that we have certain foods that we uh, like or f- certain restaurants that we'll order from on a specific show nice, nice. Uh, yeah. yeah that's fun so um yeah, here in the hall of conspiracies we have some listener mail we have an email with oh. a theory charlie would you like to to read uh, on this theory because uh, technically it was meant for our sock opera episode, but since it talks about the machine and we revisit Stan's machine here, yeah. it uh, feels fitting. So this is from uh, one of our server admins, uh, Friendly Local Geek. It says, uh, Friendly Local Geek here with something you could do during your sock opera episode. Oops. Now that you guys are getting close to starting season two. I also go by... Andy Royd on TV Tropes, and I distinctly remember posting on the Wild Mass Guessing page after Sock Opera aired, Bill Cipher wants to use the power of Stan's machine to turn Gravity Falls, and perhaps the rest of the world, into a world of chaos. Something is drawing supernatural weirdness to the Gravity Falls area, and the machine in Grunkle Stan's basement is tapping into that source for whatever reason. Bill plans to hijack the machine and turn up the strange happenings even further. The messages that have been appearing at the end of the first few episodes of season two appear to be from Bill Cipher, specifically the one at the end of Sock Opera. No puppet strings can hold me down, so patiently I watch this town. Abnormal soon will be the norm. Enjoy the calm before the storm. If it is a message from Bill. It seems to suggest the nature of the big things that are coming. He wants to increase the levels of weirdness in Gravity Falls or spread them further. Why would he do this? Perhaps Bill believes stirring up strangeness in the mortal world will increase his own influence as a dream demon, or perhaps he's just doing it because he thinks it would be funny. Good theory. That's very Um, interesting, yeah. I mean, you know, I think one of the scariest things about bill is what what is his purpose what it, what does he want yeah. just what's like, the deal with bill Cipher? what's the deal like is it just is we it don't know just, much we don't know much at this it, point it doesn't seem to be even power as much as it is chaos i mean it is power but i mean that the thing well, oh, that's in a later episode. I thought the thing was referenced in the Shapeshifter episode, but um bumps. <laughs> yes, I do love that movie. And I love the Shapeshifter and uh, the Into the Bunker episode. But, you know, he it just seems like Bill, he just wants to, he's just one of those guys. He's one of those guys at the concerts who's just going around punching people in the face. That's, it's a, it's a good theory. What does, what does Bill want with these people, with Gravity Falls in particular? He's influenced people all through time. Why? Why? What, There's a picture of JFK on his chest when he says he knows lots of things. I know that. Is what, so, what, do do, what do you do? What do you do with JFK? Did they hang out? Did they play I golf? Mean, seems like it. Yeah, sock opera gave us some in- inkling into his character, but not really his greater motivations. And yeah, this is a, this is a very solid theory uh, that our friend had at the time. Yeah, I like it. I like it a lot. Uh, Jason, you pointed out as we were watching that. The the agents from Scarioke, Powers and Trigger, are spotted again when Wendy throws the CD out of Seuss's truck window. It's really quick. It's probably the hardest of, at least that I can remember. Uh, golf there are some golf where, where yeah. we have not found anyone find until, like, this year. Yeah, yeah, because they're super tiny in the background. And they're, they're very simplified models. They just look like golfers, and one of them has a mustache and one doesn't. <laughs> yeah. They look like gingerbread men. <laughs> But this yeah. one is very, yeah, this one is like a frame or two uh, yeah, long. It's and so fast. Something I thought about, uh, because I know, like, thinking about talking with you about your introduction to the fandom being blended, being uh, hidden in the first three episodes, 
realizing that this is just sort of another parallel or an escalation that season two does on top of season one. We talked about uh, episode one of season two, or episode one of season one has a fake, a zombie fake out, and episode one of season two has real zombies, and kind of the the little Apuchians, the the golf balls capturing Pacifica, and there's a golf cart chase is kind of paralleling the gnomes, and it's these escalations and parallels that I'm realizing the agents is kind of like, okay, remember when you were sleuthing around for Blendon hidden in, in episodes? Do that again more often, harder, and also more important, because it's building up to them doing something about the Pines family because well, they're I, spying on them. I think also it, it serves another purpose, which is to say scour the backgrounds anyway because you're yeah. going to need a code word in, to yeah. solve the cryptograms at the end no, of the yeah, episode. This show is it's fantastic at training your brain to, to look for things in ways that you don't even necessarily... Like, even for people who aren't necessarily like us. Yeah, who, I was about know, to say, training your every brain frame. to look at everything actually sounds unhealthy for us to be an ADHD. <laughs> well, I, but, but, you know, what's what, what's true is is that it, it actually, at, at a certain point, my fandom of the show took over my ability to initially enjoy episodes. Like, I couldn't just watch. Interesting. I was, all, I was already, you know, like, especially in the beginning of this one, I remember pausing when I would see the, um, you know, the, the, bo- the, the, the bulletin board, board or whatever, yeah. you know, and just being like, so you're like, yeah, just, like you're like, missing the jokes. And yeah. Yeah. Miss, yeah I, you know, I had uh, to, you know, like, TV shows are supposed to be consumed for fun, Jason. I know. I remembered that afterwards. So. <laughs> we, whenever we watch, whenever we watch an episode uh, on the DVD that uh, Charlie will, will screen share with me putting in their computer. Every time, every time they pause, we have to remember, like, oh yeah, this isn't streaming. This is on a physical disc. Yeah, and and the, every time the, you pause, the, you're like destroying every time the disc. I pause or go back and press play again, the the DVD sounds a little crunchier when I press play again. Oh gosh! <laughs> but yeah, it's like the way that they are very subconscious about, like, okay, this is important, but we're not going to telegraph that it's important. Is like even for people who aren't. Uh, yeah, you know, as painstaking as as we are naturally about puzzles and stuff, even for someone who started out more casual, I guess, which arguably you did, but I guess what I'm saying is for people whose brains don't operate like that around puzzles, mm-hmm. yeah, they could the, be turned for over. For the Mabels of could, the world like me. Right. <laughs> I think they, they could be turned I, 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 into something of a dipper. Mm-hmm. Yes, exactly. I think... Jason has already pieced together that we have very, Ella and I respectively have very similar energies. Dipper and Mabel energy. Yeah, I, have, yeah. I scream yeah. about half of the things I say. I understand this. I know it, and I'm comfortable with it. Yeah. Do either of you do escape rooms? Yeah, we yeah. love escape rooms. Well, we used to. I know we used to back when I was. Safe. Yeah, no, we don't like touching things that other people have touched anymore. That used to be our thing. We're not into it anymore. Right. Yeah. yeah. No. Same. But but the first couple times I did an escape room, I I went way deep in the weeds. I would like look at a book on the shelf and be flipping through the pages, and you'd miss the forest for the trees. Yes, and exactly. Like, yeah. And you you start to realize, oh, there's a language. You don't have to go this mm-hmm. deep, or yeah. you know, this yeah. is the level that you have to be in. I think Gravity Falls did a good job of saying this is the swimming pool that we're in. I, so, you're making it way harder for yeah, yourself I, uh, by looking at every yeah. beyond, yeah, a, uh, exactly. uh, beyond escape rooms those uh before they existed in the meat space those are based on point and click adventure games oh um, yeah that's how i started to i what i was what yeah. was your poison jason uh submachine okay uh, i think um but there were also i'd go on some sites and just it would be like the point and click of the day i yeah, yeah, like yeah. probably video game creators tr- yeah. like just trying stuff out and putting it on uh, uh, site. I I am uh, irrevocably obsessed with Monkey Island personally. Oh, uh, Monkey! Oh, yes, yeah, of course. Back like back in the in the day, um, Monkey Island. Yeah. So yeah. I mean, I always grew up with video games and stuff like that. But um, uh, you did laugh when I made a Zelda pu- puzzle solving noise while we were watching it. <laughs> I did. I did. I got that as well. <laughs> no, I remember you were the you were the world's foremost street passer in the 3ds days. I was. I really. Uh, I. I still have my 3DSs, and now I no longer bring them out because it's just too sad. I, they just street <laughs> pass. Zero street two. passes. Desolate. And they street pass with each other, and so that green light lights up, and I'm like, "Is it somebody else?" And it's just me going like, "Hey, is anybody out there?" I think my. <laughs> I still love you, Danky Kang from New York. <laughs> yeah. 
So, Charlie, would you like to read the next? Okay. At the end credits, when Stan said, No one's going to get in my way. It closed in on a picture of Mabel and Dipper. I think this may foreshadow that Dipper and Mabel will stop what Stan is doing. Thoughts? And that was by a deleted user on the Gravity Falls subreddit, um, whose name is lost to the sands of time. But Wow. Uh, the reply is by a user named Blackfire2013, who says, Right? I thought that maybe it closed in on the picture because he wanted to build the portal. Because he, in a weird distant relative kind of way, wants to try to bond with the twins. Or he did it because he wants to show Dipper that the thing he is obsessed with is very dangerous and he should find a new hobby. He he does talk about in Scarioke that, that Dipper's stubbornness is uh, maybe going to get them into trouble. Mm. I, it's amazing what people like pick would, up on. And Would and... you like to read the next one, Jason? I was about to say, yeah. Okay, 90L, seven years ago, said... Just want to point out a little detail that someone might have missed in the middle of all these huge reveals. Take a closer look at the schematics behind Young McGucket in the memory file. They seem to hint that the portal's instability and failure rate grows exponentially the longer it stays active. Whoa! See, and somewhere 90L is f- freaking out because <laughs> Dipper yeah. Pines just read a comment they made seven years ago. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Well, that, that's interesting because I noticed that, you know, I, I, you can recognize the shape of the portal in some of the, the things, but I never thought about, the I want now yeah. to go back and see that little thing. But I, I do remember the, vaguely the instability and in going up. I never correlated the, the two um, things. That's so cool. And then we, you know, connecting that to every day it's getting stronger and now it is pulling things toward it. Like, yeah. Something, it's dangerous. Something's going to happen. Yeah. yeah. Oh boy. So, the user named, I believe it's Glald, uh, seven years ago as well. Or Glaldy. <laughs> uh, yeah, Glaldy. Good old Glaldy. <laughs> Has anyone noticed there was a name on one of the tubes that we haven't encountered before? Jeffrey Canuck. I've searched and found no reference of this man, which is true. Googling it only gives you the Gravity Falls a uh, bit. <laughs> right. And his tube was in the altar, along with McGucket and Preston Northwest's tube, so he must pose some significance. Could this be the name of the author? Jason, did you ever notice Jeffrey Canuck? You know, I... I The first time I heard that name was yesterday, I think, when I was... I, I like, looked through the Gravity Falls Wikipedia Interesting. episode. Oh my gosh, you, you prepared! You prepped. I did because I, I, I couldn't remember. You're a good podcast guest. Yo, if there are any other <laughs> podcasters out here listening. Of you. <laughs> it was. Yeah, and Book I wanted Jason. to see. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I, I, and it it doesn't ring a bell, and I, I didn't have time to do more research on it or, you know. But, you know, it's not it's not an accidental name. No one just put a, you know pulled a bunch of letters out of a hat, so it has to be. Well, something. Canuck is a slang word for Canadian, but other than that, I got. But nothing. this one has two ends, I believe, right? Oh, okay. Yeah, two ends. Okay, I don't know that I've ever seen Canuck spelled out. Okay. I hmm. think the the Canadian thing is with one. I'll, end. I'll believe you on this. I have no reason to distrust you. But it could be that someone named Jeffrey was from Canada. You know, it would really not uh, be out of left field for this show to. You know, like we said, they established McGucket's full name in a in a credits gag. So I would not put it past the show to establish an important character this way. No, this could be one of it. Could be it could be one of uh, Tats' friends. Oh uh, yeah, you know, could be Tats. It could yeah, be Tats', Tats, Tats his name. Po- possibly yeah. a nickname, we unless a man named Tats decided to get full body tattoos. I mean, w- wouldn't you? Yeah. Anything's possible. It is Gravity Falls. If that was your name. Probably get a couple tats. <laughs> lazy Susan does have a lazy eye, so... That's true. That's true. Okay, so another deleted user. Uh-oh. <laughs> They've got to this one, too! <laughs> they got him! <laughs> they got him! Okay, so now that the society is gone, won't the townsfolk start noticing stuff? The Mystery Shack will no longer be an attraction, but a horror show. And everyone will start remembering their run-ins with the supernatural. Mm. That's Indeed. an interesting. That's an interesting point. I mean, uh, I I do think that the mystery shack in general is for out of towners, and that the the people who yeah. are residents of Gravity Falls 
probably have gone. They've checked it they out. They understand seen that it. it's... And, and if they and have been... Those type of tourist traps are for people except traveling. For, and if, and for if, Tyler. And if there have been locals... Except for Tyler. Yeah. yeah and if they there come ha- in sometimes. And if there have been locals attending the Mystery Shack regularly over the course of the two months that Season 1 and Season 2A take place in, character design is hard, folks. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. There was already a model um, yeah, sheet for some, that guy. <laughs> reuse some background models, it's fine. Um, yeah. <laughs> and, you know, maybe they just like it. Yeah, they're fans. <laughs> he's a, he's they a want funny... to see if there's any new uh, new exhibits. <laughs> they they travel up up and down past Gravity Falls for business, and so every time they stop in, they get a little yeah, t-shirt. Yeah, 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 exactly. I got I grew up about two one or two blocks from the Edison laboratory in west orange new jersey and i did i did go there many times even though they did not they did not update it it was like no he didn't invent anything new he's still dead still dead still been dead (laughs) um so in response to this post magnus av or magnus avis um but i prefer to pronounce it like vis-a-vis no 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 you well Uh, if if you're gonna pronounce a v french you got it's (laughs) magnus Magnus. Magnus Avi <laughs> says, uh, how did that message from Sock Opera go? Abnormal soon will be the norm. Maybe it was referring to this. People will soon realize that their town is crawling with supernatural creatures and the creatures, in turn, will stop hiding. Oh, whoa. Yeah, I like that. Kind of a mind blower. I like that, Magnus V. Where did you think this was going at the time with the, with the blind eye being uh, absolved? I just was, I was like sort of, floored by the idea that there was a there was this undercurrent this society that had been going on this whole time and like we were talking about before with characters that we knew and recognized and you know that there was that, you know it, it's 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 another so anyone aspect could be anything of like at this point. yeah exactly the Trust sort of no thing one. of people you learn all this stuff about fiddleford and um you know that that the, that all of these people can have deep and rich backstories and secret lives that we don't know anything about. Yeah. Um, and stop yeah, viewing it, was, it, it was as exciting. a kid's it, show uh, indeed. Yeah. Exactly. So was that more like, did you have a specific theory or was it more just that, that idea of, Oh, like the, the gates are open. Like it sort of felt like the gates are open. And I also felt like we were getting closer. And I also it was the first time I had a shred of hope that the laptop wasn't completely, destroyed if that if, if it belonged could, to fiddleford yeah. and maybe he could fix it i was like oh please let J- us jason you, you know yeah. it's not real right it wasn't a real laptop <laughs> no gravity how falls is real say, the gravity falls is real and it will never die how many yeah. times <laughs> yeah it's true <laughs> we know this we know this also uh i'm just realizing i'm just now seeing uh has, has beatrice been on your head the whole time <laughs> no i just put her on there oh okay oh. i was like okay yeah because the, the, the crocheted uh, Beatrice from Over the Garden Wall from Etsy is now on Jason's head. You, you should feed cute. her some, some dirt if, uh, just, to, just to keep <laughs> her some more docile dirt. while she's yeah, yeah, sitting up there. Got to keep her energy up. <laughs> yeah. um, all right. So we've got a couple of cryptograms. Charlie, do you want to start with, uh, with this cryptogram? I would love to, Ella. Thank you so much for asking. Oh, you're very welcome. Oh, my gosh. Isn't she so nice? <laughs> oh, darling. Uh, I am. I really. Am. <laughs> the blind eye page in Journal Three has the author's symbol substitution cipher that decodes to. If my suspicions are correct, this is the work of Fiddleford. Does he really have to go to such great lengths to forget? Uh, at the end of McGucket's memory video, he says. Uh, and Jason, you. You could tell that it was a code. Yes. That, this is another thing that I learned from the internet, though. I, I just, you know, this was a, this was a blind spot for me. A uh, blind eye spot? A yeah, blind eye. I, uh, I, you know, I, I, it was a good reminder to be like, uh, okay, obviously Alex Hirsch didn't just say gibberish. This is but if anyone be would, it would be McGucket. I mean, they have plausible it, deniability. Yeah, exactly. And so I just thought, oh, I'm crazy now. The idea that that was like the the vocalization of a s- series of consonants and stuff that and that was also a code. Yeah. Yeah. So so this one was fascinating for me because I was messaging an acquaintance of me and Ella's after this, and she said, "I'm still trying to figure out what what McGucket said," and I'm like, "It was gibberish. He just went crazy." And they're like, "Yuru," 
is is Bill. Bill. Yeah. Yeah, I recognized Yuru because that's at Bash for Bill. That's not the first time I've seen Yuru. Yeah. I need to try to figure out and this was the first time I had seen like I checked the wiki and I'm like, the wiki doesn't say anything. It's probably nothing. And she was like, just give me a second to try and plug in a couple different spellings of what he said. And yeah, it's Bill Cipher Triangle. Right, in triangle. the at-bash cipher, in the, the flipped around alphabet cipher. Yeah. And yeah, it's the first time that a cipher is vocalized, like you said, which is fascinating to me. That, yeah. Like, they're ramping up the intensity at which they hide things of like, with the agents being so fast on screen and like, you gotta be on it. Like, this is, you, know? A, you know, this is one of the things that Alex was so good at is knowing how subtle he could be or how, you know, like when I was growing up and there was, I don't know, there was some secret. I didn't know how to, you know, put audio into my computer and play it backwards or right. you know, do any of this kind of stuff or write things out. And he, but he knew if, if people were engaged, what they would do to solve a mystery and solve codes and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, the so fandom could, was just such a behemoth at this point. Yeah, They would exactly. solve stuff. They had the power of this community. Yeah, and he just would he just would lay these things in and go, well, if they don't get it, but for those who are looking in the corners, yeah. I will, they will they will be satisfied. They'll find something. That... And of course, he does he does do the he does a triangle around. His yeah, eye, yeah. Uh, at the end, yeah. The credits cryptogram in Visionaire, uh, the key is a race, and it is found on the spine of the Triceratops in the museum. G. Yep. <laughs> hey, Ian Worrell. Get... Make it easy for us a little chill. bit. Yeah, like, chill. Chill a little. Um, <laughs> was there ever one that you found, Jason? Or you said that it was completely relying on the internet? Th- no, this this might be one that I saw. Um, oh, gotcha, yeah. I definitely didn't see the Love God one. I didn't oh, see yeah. the I we'll didn't even there. see the one in the Gideon's prison the first time because I didn't I wasn't oh, really? looking for it. Yeah, um, I, I yeah. never noticed. I don't think I ever saw a visionary key before we were rewatching it for this podcast, and I had these notes yeah. in front of me. The credits cryptogram translates to ignorance is bliss, but bliss is boring. There you go. Good thesis statement. The end card combination cipher. Um, we've had Charlie, you sang one of them before. Oh, yeah. I'm oh, wait, going is there a to melody the, to this? Yes. Oh. <clears throat> the, so the cipher on the end card, I believe, should be pronounced. Gideon's tantrums and misspelled tattoos, Chandra's rejection, society's views, a fear of witches, a life of regret. These are the things that they try to forget. Oh, when we got okay. to, when we did sock that. opera, you had never realized that the cryptogram was supposed to be sung yeah. to the tune of Pinocchio. <laughs> I never realized that, th- that this was the sound of music. Oh my goodness. Yeah. At least that's my view of it. And that's so, yeah. Amazing. That's That's fantastic. We were talking earlier, I think maybe as we were watching the episode, about, like, what do they, what are all these members, like, why are they there? And uh, this seems to hint at each member's uh, reasons. We've got Gideon's tantrums for Bud Gleeful, misspelled tattoos for the, the Tats bodyguard, Chandra's rejections for Toby, society's right. views, presumably for the woodpecker guy. <laughs> yeah, um, people judging. Fear, f- fear of witches, the farmer sprot. Oh, yeah. Are you a um, witch? <laughs> well, <laughs> light up the... Round up um, yeah. a mob. Uh, life of regret, McGucket. Um, so it's really sad. It's really sad. Well, I think one of the things we were talking about during the episode is is like, you know, that the addictive power of... Yeah, the, yeah. The, the, the power of being able to erase your trauma or something or it's even really something a little bit bad to just like, yeah it would be very yeah. tempting it's a very human Their, desire your trauma or an annoying catchy song yeah, yeah whatever. same thing same there's thing. a whole spectrum of like what what you could maybe use that well and maybe you would the first thing you would use it for is something obviously awful that you just is torturing right. you and, and then you'd, you'd start forget. to take it for granted and then you'd and start then to you'd take it like, for granted yeah. and just be like i uh, saw yeah. something i'd rather not and then you become a yeah, yeah exactly every little thing becomes something that you can just blip <laughs> yeah and it's a very human thing with gideon's tantrums um back to little dipper like when when gideon throws a tantrum like the mom obviously is you know really really uh trying to hide her fear but but it's just pretty chill like he's just, oh, that's he's just kind of vibing. I could buy and uh, sell you, old man. Fair enough. He can erase it all as soon as he yeah. gets out of there. Whereas <laughs> yeah. poor Mrs. Gleeful, yeah, maybe doesn't get as many zaps as she would want. Yeah. So, 
Right. It's like she doesn't know. She's yeah. like, wait, you have a device that can make <laughs> me forget about this? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I could do something other than vacuum. Forget about our terrible demon son? Yeah. <laughs> so, Jason, uh, I'm also an avid viewer of Kevin Probably Saves the World and Another Period. So I had a oh, question nice. for you. Do you yes. ever intend to play a role that doesn't have a twin sister? <laughs> uh yes i do at some point uh but i i i, I went through a heavy twin phase i i really did you got I, typecasted I, as i got typecast as the type of guy who would have, have a twin. Twi- you got typecasted as the as the male version of the female lead yes exactly, exactly. <laughs> doesn't, isn't doesn't uh doesn't writer also have a twin sister <laughs> or not twin but sister and so what so tell us about the twin you inevitably will have in raising dion then <laughs> Yeah, you got. Uh, I noticed that that's there's a new season of that coming up. There so is a new season. Plug yeah, it. coming out in a yeah. couple weeks, February first. Um, Congrats. I guess there's there's sort of a it's not a twin scenario, certainly not. Um, but there is a there is a bifurcation of you know there's a separation of good your and, character. Yeah, well, yeah, not good and evil, but uh, gotcha. there's a little bit of a there's a, you, you could you could make the argument that there's a twin type of energy happening in Raising Dion as well. So you just have to watch and find out. I, I would say that you always have a twin type of energy and casting directors have taken notice. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, before you had a little acorn energy, but now it's <laughs> It's probably, all... probably little acorn had a twin sister as well. I have to admit. Ah, there's, okay. Yeah, yeah, little pine come in bunches. Yeah, Good old little pine coat. Yeah. Exactly. Anybody out there wants to give us a design for little, little, little pine, pine cone, cone voiced by <laughs> six year old Kristen Shaw? <laughs> that would be so cute. Anything else you want to plug, Jason, before we, we say our good nights? Um, I, I don't. Uh, well, I guess I would say, um, I mean, yes, Raising Dion is starting February 1st uh, on Netflix. Um, but I also just, not that it needs my help at all, but. Um, my wife's show Yellow Jackets, if you're into mysteries, and about 30 or 40 times the gore of Gravity Falls. <laughs> it's a little bit more terrifying than Gravity Falls. But Yellow oh. Jackets is a great, great show. And um, Melanie's it. amazing in it. And please, please check out The Real Story of Oak Christmas Tree. And The Real Story of Oak Christmas yeah, Tree. Yeah. Which, we really need uh, no, to no offense, you kind of peaked, though. Yeah, <laughs> I did. I did. It, it was, was like, well, I like Dipper. I, I, I like uh, Kevin. There's no Lil Acorn. <laughs> if you want to find more episodes of this podcast, you can go to our host network, PipeDreamPodcasts.com, where you can find other shows like Escape from Vault Disney, How Did This Not Get Made, and Come On Fahuquapods. And while you're there, you can find a link to our show's social medias, our Discord server, and our Patreon, patreon.com slash mystery shack. When you uh, pledge at the $3 tier, you'll get a shout out at the end of episodes. $5 tier gets you into uh, some viewing parties for episodes on our Discord server tonight. Uh, if you're listening on the day this comes out, we'll be watching uh, Society of the Blind Eye in our Discord server. And $40 Ooh. will get you either a voice acting commission from Charlie or an art commission from myself, respectively. Or disrespectively. You can <laughs> you can contact us at mysteryshacklookback at gmail.com if you want to uh, share your theories from the time. Or maybe if you're a colleague of Jason's that clicked the link and wants to maybe guest as well. I don't know. I'm just saying. <laughs> um, I want to thank Brian Brian for making the instrumental to our theme song and for voicing Stan in the Hall of Conspiracies intro. This next one, I need to specify because I wrote the word you and I want to point out that that's the royal. That's, yeah, that's the viewer. You have no obligation to come to my birthday, Jason. But okay. that being said, you plural are invited to my virtual birthday party. Uh, Ella and I used to run an improv show called Real Time Fan Dub. Those up. Uh, Sonic dubs that are everywhere are a spinoff that our friends did. Uh, we brought the band back together, so to speak, to dub the first two Pirates of the Caribbean films, and you will be able to watch that Saturday, March 19th at picardo.tv slash realtime fandom. Adam, thank you for your audio cleanup. You really zapped the memories out of that. Out of our tongues. <laughs> out of our tongues. And Jason Ritter, thank you so much for being here. Thank you both for having me. It's so fun. Talk about Gravity Falls with us. 
This is really special. I really had fun. You 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 come across as a kindred spirit of sorts. It feels I, like we same. I, I when I when I looked you both up, uh, I, I wait. I, whoa, I whoa, a... wait! You did what? <laughs> okay, now wait. Tell us more, because now I'm self conscious. I'm a research guy. You know, if someone you says, gotta do, hey, your do you want to come on the podcast, yeah. I, I say, do they seem lovely and I... nice and cool and fun? And you and well, you thank pass. you. And so do you. Wait, that's the stipulation that you want to appear on podcasts if they're lovely and nice, or do you want to be on Mean Nasty Tough Podcast? <laughs> mean Nasty Gross Podcast. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's it's in my search for the Mean Nasty Gross Podcast. You gotta weed out the uh, nice ones. <laughs> hold on. I'm gonna, if it is okay, I would like to do an impression of you again for a moment. Okay. Hey, everyone. This is Jason Ritter. Welcome to the Mean Nasty Gross Podcast. <laughs> Where we have opinions on things we know not much about. It really does feel like we, uh, you know, we get to talk to the, not just the voice of Dipper Pines, Jason Ritter, but the Gravity Falls superfan, Jason Ritter, which is just really fun. Well, I would just like to clarify, I am a superfan in that uh, my thirst for Gravity Falls knowledge and things is is unquenchable. So I never claim to know, every. as you can see, there are lots of holes in my... But I love it. That's all you need. The only way you could know everything is if you dedicated, I don't know, 53 podcast episodes to pointing out every <laughs> reference. But that really feels masochistic. <laughs> yes, that's true. But even then, I would argue, you know, there's fun in, in leaving some mysteries unsolved. You know, there's always another oh, yeah. thing to, to discover. I think that thirst that you're talking about is all you really need to, to exactly. be, the, to be a, of the super fans. That is, that, what you are describing is, Exactly the reason that Gravity Falls is real and it, it will never, never die. die. Never die. You know, I kind of think I'm kind of so so giddy about this whole thing and gleeful <laughs> that I might I might play us out with a song. It is a song that I wrote about Gravity Falls. Oh no way! Take me back to the place I know with the mystery shack and the forest gnomes. I'm already packed, so come on, let's go. Don't get me started. My heart in gravity falls. Hey, uh, this is Dipper 4. Uh, I'm here with Dipper 3, and we are here to shout out our Patreon supporters. Yeah. Finally, we get to do something again. We stole a bike and just been out here trying to avoid the rain. Uh, thank you, too. Daddy Driftwood? Oh, and, and it's me. Sorry. I thought. Uh, no, it's uh, okay. It's alternating. Right. Got it. Um, and to uh, Daddy Buttons. Fun Boringness? Hugh Salinas. Juno Series. Friendly Local Geek. David Gansel. Liz Clark. Ryan Faber. Stephen Patrick Mulholland. Gwen Prime. Junior Bruh. Or Jur... Jur Bruh. Junior Bruh. No, I, I think you got it. And, uh, Oliver Pluto. What are we gonna do with all this money, Dipper 3? I don't know, Dipper 4. Uh... More... more umbrellas? Yeah, lots more umbrellas, tarps. Maybe, like, a hundred more umbrellas if you could? All the waterproof. Everything waterproof. Uh, rains a lot more than, uh, than we expected. Can we laminate ourselves? Was that ever an option? I think that's a good option if we can find a place. Help two paper-based guys in the woods just being guys at patreon.com slash mystery shack.